Okay, welcome back. Robert Breaker here. Get out your Bible today and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Last week, the sermon was entitled, The Spirit World versus the Physical World. And I showed you the difference between these two very different worlds. And yet, they have so much in common. But yet, they're different. And I tried to explain to you how we are a spiritual people. When God created us, He created us in a way that we are spiritual. And so I explained that to the best of my ability, the difference between the spirit world and the physical world. And a lot of people said, Brother Breaker, that was great. We appreciate that. That really opened my eyes. That it really helped me understand some things. And I say praise the Lord for that. But I also got some feedback from some people who were saying, Well, Brother Breaker, um, expound on that. Explain some more. Show us more about the spirit world. Now, you got to be careful. You don't want to get too much into this because there are some evil entities in the spirit world. But the spirit world is where God is. So it's good to know this. So what I thought I'd do today is I'd just call this the spirit world and just show you what the spirit world is to the best of my ability and bring out some other things that I wanted to explain last time I just didn't have time to do. Now there is a book out there that you can get by Clarence Larkin, the greatest book on dispensational truth in all the world, and uh, he in this book talks about the spirit world. And uh, so this is, is kind of interesting if you want more information on this, uh, page 96, the spirit world, okay? And so he talks to it. Matter of fact, Old Clarence Larkin uh, even wrote an entire book entitled The Spirit World. And so you can get that book as well and learn more about it from a Bible perspective, okay? A lot of things in the world today are spiritual, and they talk about the spirit world, but they come from the other side. And they talk about it not from the biblical perspective, but from a new age perspective. From contacting the evil entities, if you will and explaining it from their side. No, 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 I'd rather go to God's side. I'd rather go to the Bible. So we've got a lot to speak about today and a lot that I want to get into. So if you would, take your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 through 16, and we'll start there. Then I've got a lot to write up here today, and I hope this will be a blessing to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, says this, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now where is that? That's in the spirit world. That's in heaven. So we can't even imagine in our mortal minds, in our, in our physical minds, we cannot even envision how great heaven will be. And heaven is in the spirit world. So if you're saved, you're going to a wonderful place. So you better be saved. If you're not, well, what's the alternative? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. But it says here that uh, we can't even understand in our natural condition the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. But God, verse 10, hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So there are some things in the Bible that God has revealed to us in the spirit world. Now, we don't know them all. <laughs> The uh, Bible says if you're saved, you get a mansion in heaven made of pure gold. Can you imagine ho having a home and all the walls and all the floors and all the ceiling, everything is just pure gold? Wow, that's incredible. But it says that the Bible is what we're supposed to have and that the Spirit of God reveals it to us through the Word of God. So we need the Bible, and the Bible is Spirit, and it, it speaks to us from God. Verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. That's why you need to be saved. You need to be born again. You need to have God's Holy Spirit in you, dwelling in you, teaching you things. And the more you read the Bible, the more the Spirit can teach you. Uh, see John chapter, uh, I believe it's 16, more on that, how the Spirit teaches us all things. And uh, so it continues there. In verse 12, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we may know the things that are freely given to us of God. So it's not wrong to know about the Spirit world. So that's why I want to talk about it today. But I want to teach you it correctly so that you can see it from the perspective of God in the Bible. Because the other perspective is of the devil. And the devil is in the spirit world, and he dabbles in some very nefarious evil things. Don't dabble in the spirit world with demons get to the Bible and Christ so that you can be in the spirit world where the good things are, where God is. And then verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, 
but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. See, a lot of people in this world that are lost, they, they laugh at the Bible. No, that's, no, there's no spirit world. And yet a lot of those people have the spirit of the world in them, and maybe even unclean spirits in them. If you believe in a devil, then there must be a God, okay? A lot of people are serving the devil today, but they don't. I don't understand how they could do that and think it's going to turn out good for them because God created the devil, and God tells us the devil's not going to be around forever. I've got a place for him, and he's going to go to that place, and all those that serve him will go with him. I don't see how anyone would want to follow the devil. I don't get it. He's a loser, and he doesn't win in the end. The Bible tells us that. So why would you follow a loser? Well, anyway, it says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. There are some things that we are to discern through the Spirit of God. So when we are saved, we have the Holy Spirit leading us and helping us to discern. I think my father's favorite word was discernment. And he would always say, Son, practice discernment. Discerning is important. 15, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So when we are saved, we have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in us. Now last week, I drew this up here a little bit for you. And there's so much that I want to put up here, I'm kind of thinking to myself, where am I going to put all this? But last week, I showed you the, the difference between the spirit world and... And the physical world. And I, sh I wrote up here physical world and the spiritual world and how there's an overlap. So if you haven't seen that video from last week, please watch that. Because every one of us in this world, we're in this world, the physical world. But we can be walking in this world and have in us someone from the spirit world controlling us. So I put it as an overlap. If you're saved, you have God in you, and the Bible says it's the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost is supposed to lead us, and we're to walk in the Spirit. So we're literally walking in two worlds at once when we walk in the Spirit. But if you're lost, you might have a spirit of this world. You might have an unclean spirit and being led by devils, which are in the spirit world. So I showed you that last week, and I don't want to go too much into that again today, but I do ask you to make sure that you watch that video um, before you watch this one. The spirit world versus the physical world was the title, and I go into more on that. So this is our world that we live in. We are in the physical world now. But this world, the physical world that we live in, guess where it came from? The spirit world. Because the spirit world is where God is. And so God created this physical world in which we, in, we are in. Now, people say, oh, I don't believe that. Oh, okay. Well, let's go to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. The Bible says it. The Bible says in the very first verse, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So, I oh, don't believe it. Well, someday you'll believe it. When you die... You leave this physical world, and your soul, which is immortal, I think it's so funny, I said on my sermon last week, the immortal soul, and several people on the comments are like, there's no such thing as an immortal soul, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's just, I said, you know what, I'm going to do it. And I went to the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, and I copied and pasted and put into the comment. The 1828 Webster's Dictionary says, immortal, living forever, like the immortal soul. And that was actually part of the definition of the word. Our soul inside of us is immortal. It's going to live for all eternity in the spirit world in one of two places, above or below. So we are physical in our flesh. This is a fleshly, physical body. But inside of us is a soul that will live in the spirit world forever. So you need to know that. You need to know that. Now Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So this is talking about Jesus Christ. And it says that all things are held together by the word of his power. Now in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. How did he do it? He said, let there be. And his speaking from the spirit world, his words made physical things. Now, I can't explain that. 
I have no idea how to explain that, but that's what the Bible says happened. So what is physical? Well, I don't want to get into physics. I don't want to get in too much into uh, biological science. I don't want to get too much into all this. But what's an atom? You look at a thing called an atom, and what is an atom? It's a proton and a neutron, and going around it is an electron. Now, have you ever thought about this? How, how does it work? Everybody looking at me right now and listening is looking at my body, and my body is nothing more than a whole bunch of little tiny, tiny, tiny atoms that are so small you can't even see them. And they're all moving. That electron going around is keeping those two things together. Every makeup of what I am, down to the smallest point, is an atom. And every atom is three parts. Neutron, proton, electron. Let me go ahead and write that up here. Neutron, proton, and electron. And you should have learned this in school. Hopefully you did. But what is that? Well, that electron is moving around. And what's inside that electron? A positive and a negative. You've got this thing here that is held together by something moving around it. So everything is in motion. Everything in this world, the physical world, although we can't see it, is moving right now. This pen is actually moving. If you look down at the subatomic level, everything's just moving, vibrating, turning at all times. So it's an interesting thing to think about that we are not stationary beings. Within us are all these atoms that are moving at all times. What if it stopped moving? Did you ever think about what would happen if the electron just stopped? If that electron that's moving around, you know, that's what electricity is. And I know nothing about electricity, although my name is Robert Breaker, you know, like circuit breaker. But I do know this, that the way that electricity works is, that's where the word electricity comes from. Electrons are always moving, and they get them to skip and jump to another one and jump to another. So everything is in motion. It's crazy. What if everything just stopped? Do you ever think about that? Why well, everything would just blow apart. The only thing keeping everything together is the movement, is the motion. Where did that all come from? Well, I believe, as a Bible believer, it came from the spirit world when somebody said, let there be. And when he said, let there be, boom, it started moving. <laughs> and that's God who created all things. It's just an amazing thing to think about. Um, so let's go to the Bible and let's look at all the players, if you will, in the spirit world. The first is God. And in the Bible, the first in the spirit world is God. So let's go over to John 4, 24. I got a lot of verses today I'd like to take you to, and uh, there's a lot to look into, but let's go to John chapter 4 and verse 24. John 4, 24, God is a spirit, okay? So is there a God? Yes, yes, there is a God. And he is in this world. A lot of people are in this world. They say, well, I can't see him, so I don't believe in him. Well, you know what the Bible says? Let's go to Romans 1.20. Let's go to Romans 1.20. I read most of what I wanted to in that verse anyway. In John 4.24, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So God is a spirit. He's in the spirit world. But now let's go over to Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, look what the Bible says. Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of Him, who's that? God, verse 19. For the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says all these people that say, There's no God, I don't believe in God, I can't see God, so because I can't see Him, I can't believe in Him. And yet the Bible says, There's no excuse for you to not believe in God. All the invisible things of the spirit world... God, in such a way, created this creation that when you look at creation, you go, wow, I cannot accept this except that someone had to create it. There must have been a divine creator of all of this. That's the only thing that makes sense because it sure didn't come about through chaos and accident. And I'm going to show you some examples because in creation we have many examples of God. But first of all, what is God? Well, the Bible says... In Genesis 1.26, God made man, and God said, Let us make man in our image. Now, what a way to talk about himself. God says, Let us in our. Why, why would God speak of himself in the plural? Well, because the Bible teaches that God consists of three, and the three that God consists of are the Father, 
the Word and the Holy Ghost. So it's one God, but he consists of three, but yet those three are one. Now let me take you over here to 1 John chapter 5. And uh, there are people out there that claim to be Bible scholars. And a lot of the Bible scholars say, no, this isn't a, a verse that should be in the Bible. Why? The oldest manuscripts don't have this. <laughs> Yet this is the greatest verse in the whole Bible to show you who God is. 1 John 5, 7, the triunity of God. But they say it shouldn't be in the Bible. Why do they say that? Well, the so-called oldest manuscripts are from 400 to 600 years after Jesus. But you know what? We have quotes of the early church fathers 100, 200, 300 years after Jesus in which they quote this verse. So obviously someone took this verse out around 400 and left it out. So this is a verse that should be in the Bible because we have witnesses of people quoting this from the early time of Christ. Okay, So don't buy this lie that many people are trying to show today. Oh, 1 John 5, 7 shouldn't be in the Bible. But yes, it should. But anyway, that's just a side note there. But look what it says here in 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Now watch what it says. And these three are one. So there's three, but yet one. So God refers to himself as us and our because God is three, but yet in his mind the three are only one. Now explain that to me. How could three be one? Well, that's a good question. How can three be really be one. How can one thing consist of three? Well, you know what? We just read that verse in Romans 1.20, and guess what it says? The visible things in creation kind of show us examples of the spirit world. All right? Give me an example. In the Bible, we, we uh, read about the sun. Okay? God created the sun and the moon. Well, over there in Malachi, God is called the sun, S-U-N. So the sun it's implied, is a type of God. Now, it's not God. I don't uh, recommend you go out and worship the sun like the ancient Egyptians did. No, don't go worship the creation. Worship the creator. But the sun itself, the sun, is a type or, or something that we can look at to get an idea of what God is. And when you look at the sun, do you know the sun consists of three? Yet that great big ball in the sky is actually... Um, one. Nobody talks about the sun and says, now that three suns up there, <laughs> they say that one sun. So the sun is one. That is one sun. But the sun consists of three. There are three different rays of the sun. There is uh, one ray that is visible that you can see. When you look up, you see light. There's an invisible ray of the sun that you can't see. And then there's, there's a ray that comes from the sun that you can either see or, or not see. It's something that just has to be felt. And what is that? That's heat. So the sun puts off three rays. And I forget the names of these. Um, one is ultraviolet, and one is infrared, and the other is just simple light. Well, the Bible says God is light, so the sun is a type of God. And when we look at the sun in the physical world, it helps us to understand what God is in the spiritual world. So we have visible light. Well, visible means you can see it. Well, which one of these could we see? Well, the Word, according to John chapter 1, is Jesus, and He is the light. And Jesus came in the form of a man and took on a body of a man and lived in this world, in a physical world. And you could see him. So that's interesting. So the three rays of the sun correspond with the three that make up God to help us kind of understand God. God the Father would be invisible. It's hard to see God the Father. But the world saw God the Son. This is what Jesus is. He's the Son of God. And so they're like, oh, okay, well, he's, he's visible. And then the Holy Ghost, that's also known as the Holy Spirit in the Bible. And the Holy Spirit, why, I don't know if you can see the Holy Spirit, but you can sure feel it. <laughs> so it's interesting to me that when you look at the things that are created in this world that God made... And when you begin to understand that, it helps you to understand the things that are in that world. So there is a God, and He is real, and He consists of three, but that is one God. And the Son is a great type of Him. 
You've got the three rays of the sun. One's visible, one can be seen. Well, that would be the word, Jesus. He was made flesh and they saw him. One is invisible, can't be seen. Um, I've never seen God the Father. You know, no man has seen God at any time. Well, that's talking about the Father because we saw the Son when he came to this earth. They saw him here. But then you have the Holy Spirit, which is felt. So that's interesting to me, how the Son is a type of God. Now, go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. What are we? The Bible says, God said, let us make man in our image. So when God created Adam, he made man like himself. So all we have to do is look at ourselves, and that helps us understand a little bit more about God and the spirit world. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, the Bible says this, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So us, what are we? Well, we consist of three parts. We consist of, the Bible says, a body, a soul, and a spirit. Actually, it says spirit first. Spirit, soul, and body. I always found that interesting, how the Bible says it one way, and we always, many preachers, when they preach on something like this, they always say, body, soul, spirit. But, but that's the reverse of how the body, Bible says it. The Bible says spirit, soul, body. Why do we reverse it? Well, because we're carnal, and we are in this world where we see the body first, so we always think body, soul, and spirit. But God, who is a spirit, wrote this book, and he's a spirit, so he sees the spirit first. So when he had it pinned down and he wrote it, he said spirit's whole body. <laughs> I just find that interesting. But the Bible tells us that we are a body, a soul, and a spirit. So when God said, let us create man in our image, he clearly is, consists of three, and he made us a being that consists of three. So we have a body, we have a soul, we have a spirit. Now, does that line up with God? Well, yeah, I guess the soul of God might be the, the Father. The body, well, that's definitely Jesus because he came as a body. And then the Spirit, well, the Holy Spirit. So we are made in God's image. Now, of course, I told you last time what happened, the fall. And so then the Spirit was dead. That's why you need to be born again to get the Holy Spirit. But it's interesting when we look at ourselves, we are spiritual creatures. We have a body in this spiritual world. And the Spirit came from the spirit world. But we have a soul, and that soul is actually in both at the same time. And so that soul, when you die, goes straight to the spirit world. But it's inside of a body, that's in, so it's an immortal soul, so it's actually both. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it odd? So in the spirit world, you have God. Then you have part of us in the spirit world. Not all of us. Most of us is this body that's over here and we're in this world today. But we consist of a spirit that came from the spirit world and a soul. And that soul will be in the spirit world for all eternity in one of two places. So God created us in his image. So that's why we are a triune being. We, we are a being that consists of three. And God is a triunity. He is a trinity. That's a word some people use. He is a triune God. He is a God that consists of three, but those three are one. Just like the sun consists of three types of rays, but it's one sun. Okay? Hope that makes sense to you. I enjoy talking about these things. It's interesting. Well, in the Bible, we have what's called angels. And there are God's angels, and there's the devil's angels. What are angels? Well, angels are a little bit different than men. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. And God created the angels, but when he created angels, he created them as nothing more than just spirits. So they are spirit beings in the spirit world. But somehow they can also come over to our world. And I'll show you that here in a second. And it says here in Hebrews chapter 1, let's go to uh, verse 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So angels, the Bible calls, spirits. So an angel isn't like us. They're not body, soul, and spirit. They're just a spirit. But yet, I'm going to show you here in a minute, an angel can somehow take a body. And I'm going to prove that to you from the Bible. But they're mostly spirits. So they're spirit beings that, that weren't originally created in this world that we're in, the physical world. They're only the spiritual world. 
But after God created the physical world, these angels somehow found a way to try to get into our world. And I don't understand it completely. A lot of things that I don't understand, but it is interesting. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13, and verse 2. Let me show you something. Hebrews 13, 2. Angels can appear in our world. And when they do, they appear looking like us. They can take the form of a body like our body and appear to us. Hebrews 13, 2. Paul says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Paul says, There are some angels that can come and take the form of our body and appear to you, and you would think that that was a person. You wouldn't think that's an angel. You literally thought, Well, I thought that was a human being. So somehow angels, even though they are ministering spirits, can take on a body that appears like us, and they look like us. A lot of people say, well, don't angels have wings? Well, there are different kinds of angels in the Bible. There are what's called archangels, and in the Bible you have the archangels, and an archangel, yes, has wings. It, it appears. But not all angels do. And there were, uh, at one time, five archangels, and uh, one of them's name was Gabriel. Uh, one of them is Michael. In the Bible, the Bible talks about Michael and Gabriel, but it also talks about one who was named Lucifer. And how Lucifer was the anointed cherub that covereth, so he was called the cherub or an archangel, and he fell. I'm going to talk about him here in a minute. So you have archangels, and it sounds like they might have wings. You have another class called seraphims. They have wings. But regular angels, the Bible says, when they appear, they appear looking like men. So they look like men. Now there's lots of verses that I could go to. But let's go to Genesis 19 real quick, just one example. All throughout the Old Testament you see angels showing up. And when they appear, people look at them and go, wow, that looks like a man. So angels can appear in a bodily form in the sense that they look like a human being. And you wouldn't know. Because even, you know, Paul said, uh, some people, you, you entertained angels and you didn't even know it. <laughs> I wonder if I've ever entertained an angel in my life. I, I don't know. But in Genesis chapter 19, verse 1, And there came two angels to Sodom and even, and Lot sat at the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Now it goes on there, I don't have time to read the entire thing, but look what it says here, verse 5. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night. Why would they call them men? Because they look like men. They didn't go, hey, where are those angels with those big wings? See, a lot of people have in their mind, angels have wings. No, not in the Bible. Uh, angels in the Bible, just your regular, run-of-the-mill, average angels, don't have wings. And when they show up in our world, they can take a body in which they appear to look like men. You ever heard that before? Well, that's what the Bible teaches. Now, there's a lot more I could get into on that, but I'll stop there. And let's go to this guy named Lucifer, all right? So, in the spirit world, we have some players. We have God. In the physical world, well, that's us. But we're partly in this world as well, a little bit. But we have angels in the spirit world. But that's the good side. That's the good. Now, in the bad, we have Lucifer. And Lucifer is a spirit being, a spirit entity in the spiritual world, but he's bad, and he's fallen, and he's wicked. So let's look at Lucifer real quick. Lucifer's name, and where am I going to put all this? I've got so much to get into. I'll put it right here, Lucifer. Lucifer is also called several other things. Get with me, uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Lucifer has different names. He's called Satan. He's called the devil. He's called the serpent. Why is that? Well, because he appeared in the form of a serpent in Genesis chapter 3, and he's called the dragon. So he has several names. And he was one of the cherubims. He was anointed cherub that covereth, the Bible says, and he fell. He fell into sin. You know, a lot of people say, can angels fall into sin? Well, the Bible teaches yes. Yes, they can. So in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9, the Bible says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the devil, Lucifer, was his name at one time, is now called the devil or Satan. Now the word Satan means adversary or accuser. The word Satan means accuser. 
Now I find that interesting because look over here in Revelation chapter 12 where we just read verse 9. Look at verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So the devil is an accuser. The devil spends his time in the spirit world coming over here to the physical world and watching what we do. And then he goes to God and he says, Huh? Did you see that Christian sin? Did you see what he did? All the devil wants to do is to deceive and to accuse and, and point out every time you do wrong. Now, as a Christian, we need to live right. And the more we do right, the less the devil has to accuse us of. But thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from all sins. Amen? And the blood blots out all of our sins. But in Isaiah chapter 14, the Bible talks about the fall of Lucifer and how he fell from heaven. Isaiah chapter 14. In Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12, we read this. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend five eyes, five times. He says, I, 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 me, me, me. What is that? Pride. That's a prideful person only thinking about themselves. I will do this and I will do that. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, verse 14. In other words, he wanted to be God. He was envious of God. But God says in verse 15, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. No, no devil, you're not going to defeat God. God is more powerful than you. But he is the bad guy. He is the ant antithesis, I guess is the word. He's the one who's against God. And he is evil. He is wicked. So you have Lucifer. He's a bad guy. He's a bad dude. Now, Lucifer has some angels, and Lucifer's angels are evil too. And so these angels of Lucifer have different names. They're fallen angels, actually. He has some fallen angels that follow him. And angels are what? Angels are spirits. Well, what does the Bible call these that follow Lucifer? It calls them unclean spirits. I don't have time to run every verse that I wanted to, but in Acts chapter 8 and verse 7, there's what's called unclean spirits. And what an unclean spirit does is he looks to possess people. So the spirit world has good in it, God and his angels, but it also has bad in it. It has what we would call demons today. But the Bible always calls them devils, which are unclean spirits. And so these unclean spirits are in this world, but they're in our world too. Somehow they're in both at the same time. And in order for them to be able to affect the physical world, they have to get inside the body of a person in order to control that person, and then they can, can do whatever they want in this physical world. So they are real. There really do exist demons. Now, I don't like demons. I don't want nothing to do with demons. Uh, a lot of people said, Brother Breaker, when you do this sermon, would you give us more illustrations? Will you tell us more about what you know about the spirit world? And I don't want to go too in-depth with it. But there's been several times in my life when I've encountered a person that was demon-possessed. One time I was coming back on a bus from, uh, I believe, Wyoming. And I was coming from Wyoming back to Florida, and I was on a bus, and I was sitting in the back, minding my business, reading a Bible, and a policeman brought a woman on, very scantily dressed, very unmodest. She was showing a lot of herself with short shorts on and, and a tank top and things like that. And the policeman brought her and set her down next to me and said, Hey, preacher, you watch her now. She needs help. And that policeman left. For the next several hours, that woman told me about how she had been possessed by devils and how the man that she was with was possessed by devils, and how they tortured her, how they delight in torturing, because the demons, the devils, they fell from this world, and they want this world. And the only delight they have is harming people in this world. And she told me about how they got inside of her. She said, I can't describe the feeling that I felt. It was just the feeling of pure evil, pure filth, wickedness, vileness, just hate is what I felt when that demon came outside of me. I said, wow. And so it was kind of a scary thing to hear that, and I tried to give her the gospel, but she wouldn't listen. Now, 
other stories, a lot of other stories that I could give you. Maybe toward the end of this, I'll talk to you more about that. But uh, there's so many different things like this in the world. So they do exist, okay? This isn't just some made-up teaching. There is the good spirit world. There's the bad spirit world, okay? The bad spirit world are the unclean spirits, and they possess people. Matter of fact, in Matthew 8, 28, speaks about devils possessing people. And if you're not saved, well, then you can open yourself up to demonic possession, so that's why it's so important to try to live right and do right so that the demons don't come inside of you. So important even more to be saved. Because when you're saved, Ephesians 1.13 says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You don't have a demon in you. You have the Spirit of God in you. Light. Amen? And so once you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, nothing else can get in. Okay? Sealed means it's closed. So the Spirit's inside and sealed itself. No other spirit can come in me. Matter of fact, the Bible says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Yes, those demons can come around and oppress you if you're saved, but they cannot possess you if you're saved. I do not believe in a saved, born-again child of God being demonically possessed by a demon. Oppressed, yes. Demons can be in other people and they can bother you. But a demon cannot get inside of a saved person. That's why it's so important to be saved. Amen. Come to Jesus for salvation. So the devil has his angels. The devil's angels. I guess we could call them hell's angels. No, wait. No, that's 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 a biker gang. That's something else. <laughs> but these unclean spirits exist in this world. Now, what does the Bible say? Well, in Matthew 25, verse 41, the Bible says that God prepared a place for them where they will all go someday. And so if you follow the devil, if you follow these demonic spirits, then you're going to end up with them someday. Because there's no other place to put a person who follows the devil. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, the Bible says this. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, unto everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So the Bible says that their eternal home will be hell. And that hell is where they will spend all eternity. But until then, they can sure go around and do a lot of bad stuff. And they are. So the best thing to do is to get away from them and come to Christ alone for salvation, trusting in his shed blood for salvation. Now, some of these fallen angels are locked up right now. And there's so many things that I could go to in the Bible and I'd love to go to. But uh, let me just quickly go to Jude in verse 6 in the book of Jude in the Bible. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So there is a day in which these angels are coming out. Look at Revelation chapter 9 and verse 14. And I don't want this to scare you, but I want you to read your Bible because the Bible tells us about things that are taking place in this world and in our world and how they can, they can go back and forth. Uh, I'll never understand it, okay? To my dying day, I'll never understand with all that I've explained up here now, I can say this. The devil is in the spirit world, and all the devil wants is to be over here in our world. <laughs> he fell in that world, and all he wants to do is come over to this world. He can't reign in that world. He tried and got kicked out. He couldn't defeat God, so he wants to come over here, and he wants to take over our world. And if you read the book of Revelation, the Bible says that's his ultimate goal. He wants to sit on a throne in Jerusalem and say, I am God, and have the whole world worship him as God. That's all he ever wanted, is to be God. But what a demotion. What a thing. He couldn't be the head honcho in his world, so he has to come over to our world and try to take it over and mess it up and rule it. I'm in this world... And all I want is to be in that world. <laughs> so isn't that the weirdest conundrum in the history of the world? All the devil wants is to get in our world and run it and rule it. Well, I say, take it, man. It's all yours because all I want is get in the world that you fell out of because that's the perfect, eternal, blessed world of goodness, and this world is a corrupt world. So, Mr. Corrupt Satan, you can have this world. I'm getting glorified. I'm getting a new body. At the rapture, I'm going over to this world to be with Jesus for all eternity, and everything's going to be perfect and wonderful. And So what a weird thing that all the devil wants is what we have. And all we want is what the devil had. And we're going to get it one day if we're saved, because we're going to be with Christ for all eternity. So what a wonderful thing, but what a strange thing to think about. Now, what did I tell you? Go to Revelation 9.14. There are some of these fallen angels that are in prison now, in the heart of the earth, that at some time God is going to let out. 
Uh, Revelation 9, 14, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. I believe this is in the tribulation period. And during the tribulation, and boy, I'm running out of room up here, but during the tribulation period, God is going to first take us out at the rapture. That's here. We'll get out of here at the rapture. But during the tribulation, God's going to let these devils, if you will, uh, these fallen angels, which, by the way, are in chains down here. And I'm not good at drawing chains, but here's your chain. And they're chained up, these four angels. And God's going to let them come out. This will be part of the judgment of God upon the earth in order to slay a third part of man. So the tribulation period is the time of seven years when the Antichrist shows up. And then the Antichrist, the devil literally, I believe, possesses the Antichrist. You see, the Bible talks about all this. I wish I had more time to get into it. That's why I recommend you get a Bible and start reading. It's amazing to see what's really going to happen in the future. The Bible tells us about both worlds. And in the Bible, it talks about how when the um, Antichrist comes, he's got two names. He's called the man of sin, and he's called the son of perdition. Why does the Antichrist have two names? Well, in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, he rules for three and a half years as the man of sin, a beast, a man. But then he is assassinated. And the Bible says he has a deadly wound. Someone kills him. And then his deadly wound is healed. All right, He comes back to life, but now he's the son of perdition. Now he literally has Satan possessing him. And that's how Satan gets to rule for the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And that's when Satan, or the devil, or Lucifer, goes into the temple of the Jews and sits on the mercy seat and says, I am God, and says, worship me as God. So it's all in the Bible, and you can put all the, the dots to, together and connect them and to see what is happening and why. We live in a day and age in which the whole global world is trying to make a one world government. Many people call it the New World Order. Why would that happen? What is the goal of that? What is the purpose of a one world government in which there's one government running the whole world? The purpose is, according to the Bible, so that the devil can possess a man and then take control of the entire physical world. So where does that leave us who are Christians? Well, we got to get out first. So we leave it to what's called the rapture. So I believe in the doctrine of the rapture or the coming of Christ to take out what is his. And what is his are those who have trusted him and who have the Holy Spirit inside of him. Now, that's bad news that the devil's going to take over someday. Well, the good news is at the battle of Armageddon, the end of the seven-year tribulation, here comes Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is going to come and defeat the devil and rule for a thousand years here on earth. And he's going to bring with him the kingdom of heaven. So you'll have the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, and they'll both be here. I guess you could say the spiritual kingdom is the kingdom of God, and the physical kingdom is the kingdom of heaven, two different kingdoms. We don't have time to get into that. So we read the Bible and we understand and we look at the spirit world and we see who they are in the spirit world. We see the players. We see God. And he made us in his image to be like him. So we have three parts as he is three. But we also see the devil. And we see how the devil has his angels because everything that God has done, the devil tries to imitate. And so the devil wants to be God and wants to take over. So the devil fell out of the spirit world, although he's still in the spirit world, his goal is to get into this physical world and to rule. We that are saved, all we want is just to get over here and be with Jesus for all eternity. Amen? So it's amazing to me. I, I enjoy studying the Bible. I enjoy learning about this. And it's so sad to me to see how many people don't understand it from the biblical perspective. All over YouTube, all over the internet, there's these spirit channel guides. There's these New Agers. There's these people that say, oh, there's entities out there, and, and yes, speak to them. And these, there's entities in another dimension that want to help us and things like that. And we communicate with them. And when they start talking like that, I go, whoo, wait a minute, red light. Guess who you're really talking to? These people. When you're saved, you get the Holy Spirit. But a lot of these people aren't saved, and so they're being led by these people. 
the devils, the unclean spirits. And the Bible talks about that and how we need to be careful because they're seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and that the, the desire of Satan is to rule and to deceive. Let me show you a couple verses here because you need to know this, okay? Ephesians chapter 6. There is a spiritual battle taking place in the world and has been taking place since the beginning of time. And it is the battle for your immortal soul. Your soul will last for all eternity in the spirit world. It's already spirit now. But when your body dies, then you're only in this world. And so you're in all eternity in one of two places. Above with God or below with Satan. So which one do you choose to be with? That's what it all boils down to. And so there's this battle between good and evil, between God and the devil, over you, your soul. Isn't that a weird thing? They're concerned about you? God so loved the world, he gave his only... God loves you. The devil hates you. God wants you to be with him in his world. The devil wants you to be with him in his eternal world because he delights in your suffering. God doesn't. God delights in your company and wants you to be with him. So the best choice is Jesus Christ, God. Ephesians 6 and verse 12 talks a little bit about this spiritual battle. And by the way, some of these fallen angels, I think, are where UFOs come from. A lot of people say, UFOs, where are they? Are they just outer space, interdimensional uh, uh, entities from other planets? No, they're from another world, so spiritual world. They're not from other planets, although they might can travel out there, I don't know. But they, they have created these things. And so I believe that very shortly, there's going to be a whole lot of talk about aliens. And it might be after the rapture, it might be before. But I really believe that there's going to be showing up on this earth uh, beings that say, Oh, we're, we're aliens from other planets and we're here to do you good. And the whole world, oh, yay, yay. And who will that be? That's going to be this crowd. Lucifer and his demons. Not just some E.T., you know, extraterrestrial. I don't believe that. I believe that's the only two groups that exist. God and his angel or the devils and his followers, his angels. So watch out for that. Um, be careful if you see something like that. But in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, you say, Oh, Robert Breaker, how could you say something so foolish? <laughs> demons in outer space or fallen angels in outer space. Well, because I'm reading my Bible. And it's not foolish, because look what it says. Ephesians 6, 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness. Now watch what it says. In high places. Where's a high place? Up there. All right? So if there ever shows up in this planet creatures that say, We're from outer space and we're here to help you, you mark it down, that is not God and his angels. That's this crowd. <laughs> okay? And that's the spiritual wickedness. So they are bad. That is your spiritual wickedness. So watch out. You know, a lot of people, oh, I love this show, Ancient Aliens. And it's interesting to watch Ancient Aliens sometimes. But I'm not wanting to meet those aliens. I know who they are. They're this group. So you got to watch out for things like that. Now, who is the devil? Well, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I've just got a lot of verses that I want to show you. I want to throw this out. I want you to see this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The goal of the devil is to get your soul. And the devil is real. And he's actively working to take over the world. But he also wants to take your soul. And there are story after story after story of people who have sold their souls to Satan. And I don't have time to get into that, but many of your rock stars, many of your uh, TV stars, many of people like that, they always talk about, oh, well, I sold my soul to the devil. Have you ever seen those videos on YouTube? Some of your famous singers. And that's when I sold my soul to the devil. I really believe that's true. I really believe that the devil or devils can appear to them and say, hey, you do this for me, well, we'll do that for you. All I want is your soul. And so I believe that that's a real thing. And I think it's sad, and I don't think it's something you should ever do. Now, have you done that? Guess what? The blood of Jesus can break any curse and any contract. The blood of Jesus is the most powerful thing in the entire world, both worlds. So if you come to Christ and trust Him as your Savior, anything you did before is broken, and your soul belongs to Christ when you're saved. 
2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 says this, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. So what is the goal of the devil? The devil wants to blind you. And he wants to blind you to the gospel. So what is the gospel? Well, the gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. through 4. The gospel is all about how God died in your place for your sins. God died who is the, Jesus, the Father is God, the Word, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God. One God. But that God can manifest himself in three different persons. And he has. And one of those that he manifested was in the form of the body of Jesus who came and died on the cross for our sins and shed his blood. And the gospel is how he died for our sins. And if you'll come to him and trust him who died and was buried and rose again, then you will be saved by trusting Jesus, then you get the Holy Spirit come and dwell in you. And then you get to go live with the Father in heaven for all eternity. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. But the goal of the devil is to blind your mind to that. Don't look at that. Don't look at the spirit world where God is. Just look where we are. Don't look at Jesus on the cross. No, 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 no. Just come to us. So they want you to be sensual and wicked and vile. They don't want you to come to the true, sinless Christ for salvation. Um, I was going to say this, and I forgot. I kind of skipped over it. You know what most people in this world want? They don't want to think about God. They don't want to think about the Bible. They don't want to think about these things. They only want to think about the physical world. And so most people in this world, all they think is, man, if I could just go to Hollywood, and if I could just become an actor or a singer or something like that, make a lot of money, why, then I could be famous, and then everything would be great, and everything would be just fine. Well, you might enjoy this life for a little bit <laughs> with all that. But what about eternity? You won't enjoy eternity. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Have you ever thought about that? You want to go to where? You want to go to Hollywood? Where is Hollywood? It's in the city of Los Angeles. Los Angeles. The angels in Spanish. <laughs> Creepy. So you want to go to the land of the angels? Hollywood? Holywood? That's what Holly is. Holly is holy. Holywood? What is that? Well, that all ties back to ancient paganism where they worship the forest. They worship the woods. They worship the trees because they believe that demonic spirits inhabited the actual wood itself. So they called it their holy wood because they were worshiping the fallen angels. <laughs> the angels. I don't know about that, man. You, you, might, you might want to rethink that. What happens if you become a big star in Hollywood while well, you're called a star? A star in the city of angels. Well, you go to the book of Revelation and it says the seven angels which I saw were the seven stars. Angels are stars. You see, this world is run by this spirit. The spirit of this world. It's called the spirit of this world because the one running the world is the little G God, Satan. And he's trying to get your eyes on anything and everything but the thing that really matters, how to get back into this world with perfect forgiveness in Christ. So watch out for Hollywood and the angels and the stars. You need to watch out for that. You know, most of Hollywood is started by people like Jack Parsons and people like that that all tie back to Alistair Crowley, that all tie back to, you know, uh, Satanism. And so there's a lot of Satanism that takes place in Los Angeles and places like that. You've got to be careful. There is a spiritual thing happening. There's more to this world that we live in, and it's a spiritual thing. And the God of this world is the devil with the little g. So I don't want the little g God. I want the big g God. And it's only through Christ that we find him. Now, let's go to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So be careful. Now, people say, well, I'll just get religion. Well, you know what? There's a difference between Salvation and religion. Religion is a system of works that man does to try to please God. But God says, no, it's not works that you're saved by, it's faith. Salvation is when you give up trusting in yourself and you come to Christ alone for salvation. So I don't tell people be religious because guess what? The devil masquerades as a religious leader. Did you know that? 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look at verse 14. Actually, let's start in verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. The devil looks at all the things that God does, and he tries to transform himself into it and appear like he really is of God when he's not. That's the devil's goal, is to deceive people. And it says, verse 14, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now look at this verse, verse 15. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their work. So Satan is in everything. Satan is in entertainment. Satan is in banking. Satan is in government. Satan is in churches. Satan is in religion. And he's trying to get the whole world. Satan is in the health, I guess you could say. The health department type thing. Trying to bring about all sorts of things and, and that. Everything you can think of, the devil has tried to take over. In order to get people's minds off of Christ and the gospel. And to get them onto the things of this natural, physical world. And that's not even our home. Our, our home is the spirit world. Because that's where we go when we die. So who is the devil? He's a deceiver. And he seeks to destroy. And so everything that he takes over, he uses to try to destroy people. Look at uh, 1 Peter 5, verse 8. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, well, that's what this guy is, the accuser, Satan. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. So that's what the devil wants. He wants to devour you. Now let's go back to um, Revelation 12. Real quick, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12 and verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. We read this verse earlier. Look what it says. Which deceiveth the whole world. What is the goal of Satan? To deceive the entire world. seems to me there's a verse in Paul where he says... That in the last days, there will be people believing a lie. Well, we're seeing a lot of that today, aren't we? There are just lies everywhere. It's just crazy. You don't even know what to believe anymore because we see so many things that are just lying. Well, who's behind that? The master deceiver, the master liar. Revelation 13, 14, look what it says about the devil. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So the devil seeks to deceive and devour. And did you know the devil can do miracles? Watch out for people that claim to be of God and then say, well, we can do miracles. The Bible warns us and says, well, in the last days, that's the people that are trying to do that are the devils. <laughs> and the devil. I'm very leery of people that say, oh, I go to this healing movement, and they heal people. I'm like, is that God, or is that... Because God can heal, but he heals, not some man healing. So watch out for this false religion. Are they preaching the blood atonement of Christ alone for salvation without works? Then it's of God. If they're not, they're not. They're of the other guy. So let me close with this. People said, Brother Breaker, please give us some illustrations, some, some teachings about the spirit world and some dealings that you've had with it. All right? Again, there's a battle for your soul. God came down from the spirit world into our world, lived 33 years, never sinned one time, shed his blood, took his blood back up to the mercy seat, offered it up. Now he offers forgiveness to all who come to Jesus Christ. Then you have salvation and you go to heaven. Or... You can forget God and then go to the other world down there when you die. We have a friend that had a Bible study in his house uh, yesterday, actually, and we went over there, and he told us about how someone died without Jesus. He told us about this man who was a deputy. He was actually a sheriff's deputy and how he murdered somebody and how he was known as a, as a crooked policeman who killed people. And he said that his daddy just happened to be there in the hospital when this fella died. And when you die, that's when you leave this world and your soul goes into the spirit world. All right? Now, right now, if you're saved, you have the whole spirit of God in you. And your soul is immortal. It will live forever. But you leave this world. You see, we're in this world, the physical world, in this body. When this body dies, then we go into the other one. We go into the spirit world. 
He said his daddy was sitting there listening to this man die. I think his name was Simmons, Deputy Simmons, if I remember what he said right. And he said that man was screaming. And everyone in the hospital was like, what? What's all this screaming? And that man was dying. And he kept saying, doctor, doctor, I feel the fire on my feet. Make it stop, doctor. And he says, doctor, doctor, it's on my legs. Get the fire off my legs. Doctor, get the fire off of my thighs. They said, Doctor, the snakes are all over me. Get the snakes off of me. Get me out of this fire. And he died. Now what happened? Sounds like he hit the spirit world and he wasn't saved. So what happened? He went to the other place. Now there's a book out there called The Last Words of Saints and Sinners. I don't know if you have that book or if you have access to buy it. You should be able to look it up online somewhere and buy it. And it's interesting to see the last words of people when they die, because that's when they begin to see into the spirit world, when they're, as Shakespeare says it, when they're shuffling off their mortal coil. <laughs> I just love how he says that. Shuffle off your mortal coil. When you die, then your spiritual eyes are open and you begin to see into the spirit world. Well, this fellow, this sheriff's deputy, he obviously wasn't saved. So he saw the bad part, and he's suffering to this day. Now, when my dad died, it was completely different. My dad led me to the Lord. My dad led me to Christ. My dad was a saved man. And I was there in the hospital. I didn't leave his side for three days when my dad passed away. And uh, there was something that took place in that room. I don't know if I've ever told this on camera before or anything like that, but people said, give us some illustrations of, of the spirit world. How do you know there's a spirit world? Well, first, the Bible tells me, okay? So I go by the Bible. But I've also experienced it. I've been there when my dad died. And uh, before I tell you about when my dad passed away, my old pastor was Peter Ruckman. And I remember in school, in class, Dr. Ruckman said one time, he said, when old saints die, they ask you as a preacher to go pray for them. And he says, it's really hard because it gets so thick. And, it, and, and you go in there and he says, it, mm, it gets thick at times. Well, what did you mean by that, Ruckman? <laughs> And he said, well, you know, uh, the one time he gave a little illustration. This one time they asked me in the backwoods to go into this house and go into this woman's uh, room and pray for her because she was dying in her bed. And he says, I opened the door. When I did, he said, I just felt the presence of God so powerful that I just had to get on my knees. He said, crawled over to the woman, grabbed her hand, prayed for her, and crawled back out. He said, I just, he said, I just couldn't believe it. I, just, I never felt the presence of God like that. And then she died a few minutes later. Well, I've experienced things like that. When people who are Christians die, there's a presence in that room that you feel. And so my dad passed away. About an hour before he died, I'm laying in this hotel bed just praying and looking up. And just thinking my dad could die at any minute. And I'm just so sad. And all of a sudden, it just felt like I don't even know how to explain it. And I don't like to go by my feelings, okay? I go by the scripture first, but I'm just sharing with you this experience of the spirit world. It felt like there was this, this I don't even know how to explain it, but it was like there was this line that was above, starting, starting to slowly come down, just this line. And it slowly came down over a matter of minutes, this line, and it came all the way down to the floor. And I was over there stressed out, crying, uh, hadn't slept in several days. I just, man, I don't want my dad to die. I don't, and I felt this all of a sudden when, when that came through, it, it was just piercing. It came through you. And it, it was the most perfect peace is the only way I know to explain it. I felt perfect peace when that came into that room. And slowly, as slow as it could be, it came down. And when I felt that, all of a sudden it was like, well, everything's okay. Everything's okay. And I got up and I walked over and held my dad's hand. And I looked at him. And he was just looking up. He opened his eyes and just looked up. He just kept looking up. And he passed away right there in front of me. And I kept looking at him and looking up and looking back down and looking back. And I don't know what he saw. I wish I could have seen it. I know I was praying, Lord, can I see what he's seeing right now? But it's just that feeling of perfect peace. And then he passed away. And then slowly that, that was gone. Now, was that an angel coming to take my dad up to heaven? One of these good angels? You know, a lot of people believe that when you die, an angel comes and takes you to heaven. It could be. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us much about that. But from my experience, I've experienced 
the the good and I've seen the evil. Like that woman on the bus, she said, when I got that spirit, it was just pure evil. I, she said, I never felt such vindictiveness and hate and evil that when I felt that spirit in me. Here I am in the room when my dad was passing away. I never felt such peace, just perfect peace. You know, Paul talks about in the Bible, he talks about salvation. It's the peace that passeth all understanding. I still don't understand that feeling of peace. It was just like the whole world just fled away and there was no care in the world. It was just like everything is great. Everything is great. And it was wonderful for me to know that my dad was saved and that he went up to heaven with the Lord when he died. So there is a spiritual world. It is out there. And there are good entities and bad entities. There is God. You come to God for salvation, you have hope, you have peace, you have righteousness, you have joy. And you go to be with Him for all eternity. That's what this book, the Bible, says. But there is an evil, vile, filthy, wicked spirit out there in that world as well. That is actually in our world too, called the devil. And he has his fallen angels, he has his demons, and they're going around seeking whom they may devour. And you know what they want? They want your soul. So the question is, what are you going to do? Why don't you come to salvation? Why don't you come to Christ alone? The Bible says, through faith in His blood. The Bible says, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you'll trust the blood atonement of Christ, if you'll put your faith in Jesus dying in your place for your sins, that He'll give you forgiveness of sins, and you can know joy, you can know peace, and you can be like, you know what? This world is a mess. I'm not sleeping well at night because I don't know what tomorrow will bring. But you know what? I know I'm saved. So bring it on. Whatever the world has to offer, it's nothing. Everything's going to be great in the end because I have the Holy Spirit. Are you saved? I wanted to go on longer. I went too long already. So much more I'd like to say. But I want you to understand that there is a spirit world. Those are the players. Those are those that are in it. And that you need Jesus. Because someday you're going to spend all eternity in the spirit world. Either above in perfect bliss or below in everlasting punishment. And I would much rather you be above than below. So God bless. See you next time. Bye-bye. Someday the silver cord will break, and I no more this world shall sing. But all oh, the joy when I awake within the palace of the king, and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace someday my earthly house will fall I cannot tell how soon twill be, but this I know, my all in all, has now a place in heaven for me, and I shall see him face to face, and tell the story saved by grace. And I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. Someday when fades the golden sun beneath the rosy tinted west, my blessed Lord will say well done and I shall enter into rest and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace 
and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. Someday till then I'll watch and wait, my lamp all trimmed and burning bright, that when my Savior opes the gate, my soul to Him may take its flight, and I shall see Him face to face, and tell the story saved by grace, and I shall see Him face to face, and tell the story saved by grace. Amen. That song by Fanny Crosby and George C. Stebbins, Saved by Grace. Can you sing the same? Are you saved? Will you see Him someday in glory? If not, get saved today. Jesus saves. Amen.